there's some amazing innovations taking place in a wide variety of, of industries around the state. It's a very fascinating time as technology is really impacting everything that we do in our lives. I don't think there's been a time, there's, we've, we've seen so much innovation in such a short period of time. I mean, I'm just thinking of the Dectronics presentation that we just saw and I'm amazed seeing that you can put a screen around a corner and things like that, it's, it's, it's awesome. Our next segment is gonna be very fascinating and I cannot wait to hear the presentation from the Sanford Underground Research Facility. They're searching for answers to the most fundamental questions about the universe. This is happening in South Dakota, awesome. So to tell us all about it, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Jarrett Heiss, uh, Science Director for the Sanford Underground Research Lab. Do you come from a land down under? Well, that was perfect. Alrighty. Well, now um, something maybe not completely different, but maybe a little bit different. Uh, my name is Jared Heiss. I'm the science director at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this year's uh, South Dakota uh, Technology Showcase. Um, and woven throughout my presentation this morning will be three main elements. I'm going to talk about some of those uh, important questions, motivate the underground laboratory. Uh, I'll introduce you to the current and future science programs. And I'll also try to touch on some of the technologies that we leverage to look and explore those fascinating questions. Uh, so let's dive in. So for thousands of years, actually hundreds of thousands of years, we've been looking up at the stars, seeking to learn what secrets they hold, and to understand our place in the universe. Our observations have inspired big questions. So it turns out that the stuff we know about stuff we've been staring up at the stars searching for, makes up only 4% of the universe. So that's a statement that's both humbling and absolutely exciting. It means that we haven't been wasting our time necessarily for all of those millennia staring up at the stars. It means the universe is far more interesting than we ever imagined. And as a scientist, that makes uh, that, that makes me extremely excited to be involved in, in physics at the underground laboratory, uh, hoping to search for some of these questions. So it turns out that the majority of, the, uh, of that orange circle there represents the unknown portion of, of what we've seen in the universe. Compared to normal matter, five times more matter is found in dark matter. Uh, we call it dark matter to put a name to our ignorance, but there's very compelling evidence that we've seen from the rotation speeds of galaxies uh, to the bending of light around objects that we can't see. The balance of that orange section of the pie represents dark energy. Um, and in fact, it's the majority of, of that area. Dark energy came about as we were looking at supernova explosions and seeing that the rate of the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down, there's not going to be a big crunch, it's speeding up. There must be something pushing the universe uh, further and further apart, and that's what uh, dark energy. And so looking at these fascinating particles that we have no idea about means that there's much to discover, uh, and so that's why we're extremely excited. And even to say that we know uh, a lot about that small blue sliver, that 4%, may be overstating it slightly. So take the neutrino. It's by far the most bizarre particle that we've ever seen. It was discovered by theorists in the 1930s. It was first discovered in the 1950s. It's so elusive that six trillion, six million million miles of lead would only stop half of them going through it. The Neutrinos are all around us. Uh, they're produced in uh, radioactive decays in the Earth, bananas, 
Uh, you and me, we all pr produce neutrinos. They're also produced in nuclear reactions inside stars. You hold out your hand, 10 trillion neutrinos are going through every second. And so Dactronics brought their TV, I brought 10 trillion neutrinos. There you go. And some dark matter, although I can't exactly tell you how much dark matter there is in this room. Um, so because neutrinos uh, come in three types, and you can see them uh, sort of um, euphemistically uh, portrayed on, on that slide, they come in three types. We know that they change from one type into another. And when I said the neutrino is the strangest particle we've ever seen, well, that's one of the characteristics of the strangest particle we've ever seen. What other particle do you know of that can change from one type into another? The, we know that because they change, they have a little bit of mass. Now, we've been studying neutrinos uh, since 1950, so for 60 years we've known about the neutrino. We still don't know how much it weighs. And so getting back to my earlier statement, uh, we've been looking at the neutrino for decades. We still don't know how much it weighs. That's uh, not a fault of our scientists. It means that nature, once again, is far more interesting than we ever imagined. Um, Another aspect of neutrinos comes from the Big Bang and the fact that initially there were equal parts of matter and antimatter. Now, antimatter and matter, when they collide, if you remember your Star Trek physics, they are not into pure energy. And so the question then becomes, if there were equal parts, matter and antimatter, in the early universe, why aren't isn't the universe simply made of, of matter, or sorry, why isn't it simply made of light? Why wasn't there total annihilation of these different types of matter and antimatter? Which is another way of asking, why do we exist? Right, we're made of matter. And so we think that buried in the physics of neutrino interactions, that nature has hidden the answer to that question. We're trying to tease that out because all it takes is one part in a billion to explain the universe that we see today. When we study the cosmos, we typically climb the highest mountains or even launch rockets into outer space to perch telescopes or other instruments as high as we possibly can. We're headed in the opposite direction today for my presentation. We're going underground, and I'm going to try to convince you that there is some benefit to, to going to an underground facility to try to solve some of these really perplexing mysteries of the universe, as well as explore some of the other uh, big questions. So why go underground? The surface of the Earth is constantly bombarded by cosmic radiation, particles from outer space. They interact with atoms in the upper atmosphere, producing mostly muons. If you hold out your hand again, two or three cosmic ray muons are going through every second. If you move a mile underground like we have at our facility, that mile of rock acts as a shield, reducing the flux by about a factor of 10 million. So compared to the two or three in your hand on the surface, that translates to about one per month underground. And if you're a physics experiment trying to look for something that no one has ever seen before, say, properties of the neutrino, look for dark matter, you want to give yourself every advantage. And that's exactly why these physics experiments are moving underground to underground facilities like ours. In, in particular, they're looking to shield their experiments from this cosmic radiation that acts like noise. They're trying to listen for something so, uh, so soft, so minute, um, that this is the only way that they can do it. They could not do these experiments on the surface. So here we are in LEED. This is a, a, a picture of our facility, uh, bird's eye view. We've now been operating as a dedicated laboratory for 11 years. We opened our doors in 2007. We've also uh, received generous donations over the course of our history. Two important donations. The State don or sorry, the Barrick Homestake Mining Company donated the property in, in 2006. We also have received very strong support from the state uh, and also from our favorite banker, T. Denny Sanford, uh, combining for a total of $150 million state and private funds 
that supplements what we now receive from the federal government Department of Energy through a subcontract with Fermilab to pay our operations bill. You can see the, the 223 acres uh, indicated in, in the orange area there. Other prominent features include the open cut, 1,100 foot uh, uh, feature where uh, the mining company extracted uh, some of the, the gold uh, from the surface, as well as two main complexes uh, that house 5,000 foot holes to get to the underground. Here's a, a side view of, of our uh, property and geography. Two main shafts get personnel and materials underground. One of those is finishing up a, a state-of-the-art renovation right now. We also have uh, conduits for ventilation. About half a dozen elevations are available for, for research groups. We'll focus a lot on the 4850 foot level, which is currently our deepest elevation. That's where the physics experiments want to go. That gives the most shielding for rock. But you can see on the slide some of those red dots. Those represent some of the other experiments that are able to take advantage of our full footprint. Maybe they don't need to go to the, the, the very depths of our facility to do their experiments. So you can see uh, quite a wide range of, of experiments taking advantage of the footprint that we offer. Just a, a few words on how we support science and maybe the science as it's grown over the years. From our organization's standpoint, we have uh, a very robust program, a, an organization that supports science, making it safe and successful. So we have not only the science department, which is actually fairly modest, we have a safety department, we have an engineering department, we have an operations department. All of these entities, all of these personnel are brought together to, to really make science happen. We have a mature experiment implementation and a safety program. As well, we have experience in a number of areas that support mainly the physics experiments at this time. Uh, clean room operation, cryogens. Uh, cryogens will come in very uh, prominently here in just a second. You can see on the bottom of the slide the 24 active research groups and 182 active researchers that have grown over the years. So I started um, 10 years ago, almost to the day, uh, back in 2008, and you can see this really remarkable growth as soon as I came. That's not really my fault or my, uh, my claim. But we have grown over the years. The blue uh, portion of the graph represents activities that took place on the surface. So some experiments are able to take a facility, build their experiment, and then move that underground. And that was absolutely the case with one of our dark matter experiments. The red color represents underground activities. We opened the Davis campus in 2012. You can see uh, very much almost a step function where we had very prominent increase in the number of underground uh, activities. The black dots represent the number of groups that we would host in a given month starting off with just a few in the early days, and now it's typically 10, on the order of 10 per month. Uh, and those range from physics experiments that are there every day to others uh, taking biology samples, for instance, uh, some of the engineering groups or, or geology groups as well. Here's a, a, a quick flash of the different groups arranged by discipline. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We, we'll cover uh, examples of, of each of those disciplines as we move through the presentation. But as you might expect, the lion's share is in physics, but we also accommodate the biology, geology, and engineering groups. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, 24 groups. We've accommodated a total of 40 experiments since we opened our doors in 2007. And this is getting to be a bit of an eye chart, but we have representation from those various experiments from a number of institutions. We're running at 80 institutions now before our big pennant, uh, the Dune experiment, comes on, and I'll talk about them as well. So you can see uh, maybe you have a favorite institution, and maybe you might be able to read it on that chart. I also want to highlight the fact that we are already accommodating international researchers in a number of the experiments that we host. This is a picture of the 48, 50 foot level. Uh, this is where this, our main science labs exist. We have two main campuses, the Davis campus at the base of the Yates shaft, and we have the Ross campus at the base of the, of the Ross shaft. Shown in blue are the experiments that currently exist, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about them here uh, in just a few minutes. 
both at the Davis and the Ross campus, but I wanted to highlight in green the future. The future, it looks big, uh, as you can see depicted in those large uh, caverns um, for the LBNF Dune experiment, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well. But that will all be set up on the 4850 foot level, a mile underground. I want to give a, a bit of a sense on how laboratories are developed. Uh, and so this is a starting point for the laboratory that now hosts a, a particle accelerator underground. You start off with rock, you want to make it safe for the researchers to go there every day. You put in rock bolts and mesh, and that's what you see on the, on the ceiling or, or, or the back is what we call it in mining terms. There's a, a bolter there and an operator standing in the cab of the bolter. They're, they're making the lab safe. Fast forward a year, continuing to make it safe, applying shotcrete, which is spray on concrete, uh, painting it. Um, and improving some of the other uh, real estate there, cleaning up the, the concrete, those types of things. And then another year after that, it's home for a particle accelerator studying processes that take place inside stars. All right, we'll dive a little bit into some of the details, get acquainted with the different experiments that we have. And I'll start here with the physics experiment, the Majorana demonstrator. They're studying properties of the neutrino, uh, trying to understand the mass of the neutrino. Remember I said we've been looking at the neutrino for decades and we, we still don't know how much it weighs. It's not typically a hard thing to figure out, but for the neutrino it, it is. And it also gets back to this matter-antimatter imbalance. Why do we exist? Why is there more matter in the universe than antimatter? To do that, they use roughly 50 kilograms of germanium. And you can see those silver hockey puck-like objects. Those are germanium crystals. They're wanting to demonstrate techniques that will eventually allow them to scale up from 50 kilograms ultimately to a thousand kilograms. And at roughly uh, $6,000 an ounce for enriched germanium, that will uh, require a heavy lift, uh, mostly in the financial region. Um, right now they are taking data at our facility. In order to make their experiment viable, they have to be underground a mile they also had to produce the world's purest copper. And you see an example of that. That canister is an example of the world's purest copper. Um, and what does the world's purest copper mean? It means impurities on the level of parts per quadrillion. Um, that doesn't come up in everyday conversation very often, but it's exactly what the Majorana Demonstrator project has had to, has had to engineer. They're taking physics data. They'll wrap up by 2020. And, uh, and the next stages for them are, are on the horizon. Here's a, an example of, of how they're leveraging the technology to look for that rare nuclear decay. They use the germanium crystal, that's that silver disk. They are also having to uh, engineer um, exactly how this is going to work in terms of, oops, let's go back here. Um, in, in terms of a couple different things. So the germanium detector looks for the rare decay, the germanium atom, energetically has the opportunity to undergo a rare decay that no one has ever seen before. So the germanium uh, experiences the physics phenomena that they're looking for. It also registers that signal. So it measures charge, which will eventually convert to energy, and that's how they are looking for this, this decay. You can see some of the other innovations. It doesn't really look like electronics, but at the at sort of the top-ish end there is a low mass front end card. They have to not only produce the world's purest copper, but they want to minimize the amount of contamination across the board. So the design of that sort of Mercedes symbol, as well as their electronics, all have to be very, very deliberately manufactured to minimize the, the background signal that these elements would contribute. They've also been working with companies to design the readout cables, Ultimately, for this experiment, low, uh, low contamination, ultra pure materials is, is really the name of the game. I mentioned the, the, the ultra pure materials. They also want to not only come a mile underground to get away from the cosmic ray signals that would, that would be like the noise in a, in a, in a rock concert or a, or a sports stadium, there's also noise in, in the form of background radiation. Everything is radioactive. And the Majorana demonstrator experiment uses 4,000 lead bricks as well as some of that ultra-pure copper for the inner layer. 
in order to screen themselves from the radiation that exists anywhere in, in, in the universe. It turns out that this shield weighs in at a whopping 145,000 pounds. This is a half-filled 757 jumbo jet parked a mile underground in the corner of one of our laboratories. There are other groups that will leverage this sort of technology, a germanium crystal looking for gamma ray signatures of radiation, uh, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. That's the Black Hill State University underground campus where they have miniature versions of the Majorana demonstrator project. One germanium crystal and a shield not with almost 5,000 lead bricks, but more like 500, but it's the same concept. Let's talk about uh, the next experiment, the looking for dark matter called the Lux or Large Underground Xenon Project. They were using about a third of a ton of xenon, and in fact, they wrapped up data taking a couple years ago and decommissioned last year. Even after they turned off, a year after they turned off, they were still the leading experiment. They were the most sensitive experiment anywhere in the world looking for evidence of dark matter. They are moved out of the way to make room for the next generation called Lux Zeppelin, LZ. So we've moved the Lux experiment out of the way and moved it to our visitor center. So it's not looking for dark matter anymore, so that's why I say it's, this is not how you look for dark matter. But it is educating South Dakota visitors, students uh, come for field trips to our visitor center. If you're in the Black Hills, I, I highly encourage you to, to visit. It's, uh, it's well worth it. But there it is on display. But the next generation is already underway in terms of its design and the funding and, and even the construction has started. Remember, Lux was a third of a ton. LZ will be 10 tons, so it's 30 times the volume in xenon. They will use much the same strategy, but they will improve the shielding. Shielding for the Majorana project, remember, almost 5,000 lead bricks. For the LZ experiment, they have 72,000 gallons of ultra-purified water, as well as a, a new addition for this version. They're going to put some liquid scintillator that will help identify neutrons even better. Right now, they're, they're starting to assemble their detector on the surface. This was the same strategy that Lux used. If you go back to that plot that I showed of the, of the effort over time, that blue section corresponded to Lux assembly. Now LZ is doing the same thing. Everything is easier on the surface. If you forget a wrench underground, you might be out of luck for, for that shift. Whereas if you're on the surface, you can just go down to the hardware store and you're back in business in a few minutes. They are hoping to start taking data uh, after moving the experiment underground next year, taking data in 2020, take data for maybe about five years. This is how the, the Lux and the LZ experiment operate. They are looking for an incoming particle, hopefully a dark matter particle, a weakly interacting massive particle. It hits one of the atoms inside, a xenon particle in this particular case. It deposits energy and gives off light in that interaction. So there's a burst of light initially, that's that S1 signal. There are also electrons liberated in that interaction. They are drifted upwards in an electric field and interact in a gas volume at the top of the detector for a second signal, the S2. And it, comparing the S1 and S2 signal sizes tells them what type of particle interacted in that volume. Also the timing from the S1 to S2 gives the depth. So you see X, Y, and then Z. That's a time projection chamber uh, technology. And it also has to have a very, very pure xenon, has to have very, very pure uh, um, construction materials for that cryostat in order to preserve the interaction um, without eating up the electrons, for instance, that are, that are being uh, drifted up to the top of the experiment. So very common design theme for both the Majorana project looking for neutrinos as the dark matter projects looking for, uh, for interactions in xenon. All right, we're going to shift over to the Ross campus, where we'll introduce you to the Compact Accelerator System for Performing Astrophysical Research. It's a bit of a mouthful. CASPER for short. They have a particle accelerator underground studying processes that take place inside stars. Their main uh, they're mainly driven by the School of Mines in Rapid City. They're the lead, and they've been operating, taking data with their beam, or at least operating their beam since 2017. They started taking data earlier this year with a, with a nitrogen target, and they'll move on to other targets. 
they plan a, an operation campaign for the next uh, five or six years through 2020 and, and probably beyond that, we hope. This is what it looks like uh, in all its glory. This is about a 40 foot long accelerator operating at 1 million volts. That sounds like a lot, but it's measuring processes that take place inside stars, processes that take place at 15 million degrees, uh, give or take. You may be familiar with other accelerators in the world, say the, the Large Hadron Collider in, in Europe. That is 90,000 feet long, producing energies that last occurred at the Big Bang. This is a relatively low energy machine. Uh, like I said, the, the temperatures inside stars, relatively modest compared to the high energies that we're looking at for, for Big Bang physics. The last uh, laboratory here that I'll, I'll mention is the Black Hill State University underground campus. They're really a service to some of these experiments looking to choose materials that would make up their detectors. So for the Majorana demonstrator, for instance, they had to develop techniques to produce the world's purest copper. They had to measure the radioactivity of all those lead bricks. They had to measure the radioactivity of the cables and some of the insulators in their experiment. Similarly, for the Lux and LZ experiments, they had to go choose the nuts and bolts and light sensors, and in some cases, choose between them, pick the best one, pick the, the cleanest one. And in other cases, they didn't have a choice, but they needed to characterize the radio purity of those materials so that they could model their backgrounds, know what they would expect for a signal. And that's what is done in, in these, um, these mini Majorana detectors, these germanium detectors. Right now they have six operating, two are sort of in late stages of commissioning. They measure parts per billion, um, and that's sort of the level that a lot of these experiments are, are looking at for, for some of the materials. This is the, the entrance to the Black Hill State University underground campus. Basically it's a cavern with a clean room. Inside that clean room, here are some a portion of those six operating um, low background detectors with the germanium crystal. You can see the little shiny rectangles. Those are germanium crystals surrounded by about 500 lead bricks. All right. An impressive group of scientists is coming together to study neutrinos in exquisite precision. You see the numbers there, 1,000 plus scientists uh, from 170 institutions from 30 countries. This is an international effort. It's also a planetary effort. We're shooting a beam of neutrinos from Chicago at Fermilab through the Earth, 800 miles, 1,300 kilometers, to large detectors that are located at our facility in Leeds, South Dakota. The facilities uh, are due to start construction later this year. Uh, really, that will mean how we handle removing the rock. 875,000 tons of rock will be necessary to be removed to accommodate some of the, the large detectors. And I have an example there. That green, that green beast there is about five million pounds of steel that will act as a cooler times four that will eventually hold 50 million liters, 13 million gallons of liquid argon. The liquid argon will catch the neutrinos that are, that are arriving from Chicago and allow us to study the oscillation parameters, the, the changing of neutrinos from one type into another. And not only that, but we'll compare the matter and antimatter versions of that and really explore this matter-antimatter asymmetry. They're hoping to start uh, taking data underground 2024 and operate for 20 or 30 years. Uh, this, is a, this is a big part of our future, for sure. There's our congressional de delegation, very, very strong support on the Hill, uh, and here they're, they're putting their back into it, moving uh, some of that first 875,000 tons of rock. Not to be uh, uh, left out of the, the equation, I wanted to just quickly mention the, the biology, geology, and engineering groups, uh, the so-called Bee Gees, and I'm not going to flash up a picture of the Bee Gees, so you can thank me for that later. Uh, but this, this includes uh, folks that, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, that take advantage of our full footprint. They're taking samples all over the half a dozen elevations that we make available. So you see some, some examples of, of biologists at the top, some earth scientists in the middle. They're, one of the big projects there is exploring geothermal energy. 
In the U.S., geothermal energy has an opportunity or potential for providing power to 100 million homes. And then engineering. There are groups that are using our environment underground to study engineering problems, failure rates in chips, for instance. Here's some pictures. Uh, in this particular picture, uh, biologists are sampling water flowing from a legacy drill hole that extends thousands of feet into the rock. They're looking for what life can live in, in the rock. In some cases, they're trying to grow that um, culture of those organisms onto different substrates. Uh, and in some cases, they're even providing electricity that mimics how these microorganisms might live inside rock, what mechanisms allow them to, to, to live, what powers them. Here's a, an example of a, of a device used for that geothermal project. They're wanting to explore, uh, so first of all, they've drilled eight new holes uh, in addition to the 2,000 or so that we had uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the facility. They drilled new holes, they installed instruments in six of those holes, and they're looking to fracture or produce uh, a network of fracture to flow water and extract heat uh, from, from the rock. And the instrument shown in the foreground here allows them to measure deformation in those drill holes uh, as they pressurize that system. So to close today, I'm, I want to leave you with uh, a quote from Albert Einstein that sort of gets to the heart of why many of us are so excited about underground science. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions, so if you raise your hand, Chad or I will come over to you. Nikki Gronley with SDN Communications. So you have a room full of people that are in technology and also some people in government, local and state. What are the positives and negatives of having this lab out in the Black Hills? What do you guys need uh, to continue your work out there? What do you run into? Uh, I'll, I'll start with the positives. Others alluded to the government research centers. Some of the uh, projects that have come through in our facility benefited from some of that funding, going back to the low background counters, for instance. And there are others, um, I don't know where Eddie is, but he and I uh, sit on the RCC uh, Reach Committee, um, and they're funding and helping to select an EPSCOR um, Tier 1 NSF funded project, that uh, will go ahead and they're looking for um, biology, biofilms will be uh, potentially receiving $10 million from the federal government, leveraging some of the organisms that we have underground in our facility. So the, certainly the funding uh, is, 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 is good, it's been increasing. Uh, there's been very strong support from the state as, as I mentioned. I would also mention the bootstrapping of the PhD physics program. Uh, Ten years ago, there was not a, a PhD physics program in the state, one of two in the country, uh, and that has now come online. So I think this, the state has been incredibly supportive. Um, and uh, when we didn't have the original funding from the, the federal government and had the transition, we were certainly leveraging that. Um, in terms of what we need, I, I think we're only now just seeing some of these elements come together, and so it's hard to, 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 to point to deficits right now because I think with the PhD program and the new faculty that are coming on and the students that are folding into these projects that I just mentioned, uh, I, I think there really is a, a perfect storm where these resources are, are really coming together and I think we'll be able to take better advantage of that uh, and we'll be able to see those advantages in, in the out years five even 10 years, the LBNF Dune project will also see very strong South Dakota participation. Um, so I, I, I didn't get you very many detractors on that or too many uh, ways to help, but I, I, I just really, from the lab's point of view, we've been just incredibly thankful for, for the state support and for the congressional uh, support on the Hill. Chris Nelson, Public Utilities Commission. I don't know if there's a short answer to this question, but Help me understand how neutrino research is relevant to Joe Citizen. How do you answer that question? Yeah, I, I was actually expecting that question. <laughs> uh, as you imagine, uh, the neutrino, given its elusive behavior, isn't going to make your computer run faster. It's not going to make your TV any brighter or uh, decrease the, the pixel width. But there are some, some, 
some uh, spin-offs from it. I, I mentioned the, the, the growing of the, the, the PhD program in South Dakota. That, that comes back to some of the research that we're doing. Um, and the education benefits within the state uh, can't be understated. Uh, so the, having students educated in STEM fields is, is, is incredibly important. And, and really, that was one of the reasons that Denny Sanford contributed the $70 million that he did. He saw that, that vision. Now, if you ask any of the scientists uh, why this is important, it's understanding the universe, but that doesn't, that doesn't satisfy maybe this audience or, or a lot of audiences. One practical application I'll, I'll mention um, comes from some of the physics that we do. There are me medical imaging comes from nuclear science. So when you go get a, a CT scan or a PET scan, a lot of that came from, from nuclear and particle physics spinoffs. For the neutrino in particular, um, the one main application right now is non-proliferation. You can't stop a neutrino with the amount of lead that you can put on a, a, a semi-truck or for anything that you can transfer uh, through a, an international border, for instance. The neutrinos are going to get through. And so w with the detector technology getting more efficient, getting even smaller and smaller, looking for signatures of neutrinos, uh, is, is definitely one of those benefits. So, for instance, you could park a neutrino off the coast of North Korea and know what they're doing in those reactors. That's one concrete benefit of, of neutrino research. Now, if you ask me about dark matter, I don't have a very good answer for dark matter yet. But, but neutrinos, 10 years ago, I, I would have said, oh, we don't have any good answers for neutrinos, but, but nowadays we do. And that's, that's one example. Time for one last burning question. Anyone? There'll be a quiz. Very good. Well, thank you.